Welcome to Matters Financial and Geopolitical from the Frontier. Thank you for stopping by. Um, just to remind you of that Al Jazeera Inside Story program I participated in is Can Africa Curb Illicit Cash Flow? Continent wide problem results in over a trillion dollars siphoned off since 1980. Um, and that number is entirely credible, uh, by the way. Home thoughts I finished The Secret Agent last night. And uh, I give you one quotation from chapter three. It's rather good and rather disturbing point of fact because you actually know the end, the outcome much earlier. Um, it's like a premonition. Joseph Conrad, the secret agent, chapter three. They swarmed numerous like locust, industrious like ants, thoughtless like a natural force pushing on blind and orderly and absorbed, impervious to sentiment, to logic, to terror, too, perhaps. Cactus culture in Borrego Springs, California, is a photograph I found on photo booth and liked. Political reflections, there are different schools of thought about how this can be achieved, but loosely speaking, they fall into two categories, dragon slayers and panda huggers. Dragon slayers favor a strategy of containment, while panda huggers favor engagement. In this article, which is in Counter Punch, it says Obama wants to draw the Kremlin into a protracted civil war that will weaken Russia, discredit Putin, and shift public opinion to the side of the US and NATO. So there you have it. It looks, it looks like Obama's provocations will draw Putin into the fray after all. But will things turn out the way that Obama thinks they will? Will Putin follow Washington's script and leave his troops in the east where they'll be picked off by US funded paramilitary guerrillas and neo-Nazis, or does he have something else up his sleeve, like a quick blitz to Kiev to remove the junta government, call for international peacekeepers to quell the violence, and slip back over the border to safety? Whatever the strategy may be, we won't have to wait long to see it implemented. If Yatsenyuk's army attacks Slavyansk, then Putin's going to send in the tanks will be a whole new ball game. Um, and I wrote about this yesterday, and I'll just remind you what I said. I said President Obama drew a red line, and in a manner as incontestable as flying two B-52s directly into the ADIZ at the end of last year. I was referencing the Senkaku comments uh, President Obama made, and I was saying about Syria that I thought, given that Erdogan's fingerprints were all over the trigger event, to advocating intervening on such a compromised pretext was a cacamamie idea. I said, I'm surprised the US is pivoting in two directions simultaneously, i.e. both to Ukraine, Russia, and to Asia, China. Nevertheless, one senses that the US security complex senses it has a decisive advantage now, and that this is set to erode the nature of advantages is you need to press them. I said the president has been a sophisticated and aggressive exponent of a new kind of 21st century warcraft. The weak Obama canard is cute, but it's a nonsense. I learned from a Bloomberg report that Obama even flew through China's air zone with Air Force One after filing only a routine of flight plan. I'll put up a photograph of President Obama and the Philippines President Aquino raising glasses for a toast during a state dinner inside Manila, and then another photograph of President Obama participating in a meeting with Prime Minister Mohammed Najib Abdul Razak in Kuala Lumpur. The New Yorker is saying Obama is betting on Asia, um, the Philippines being his last stop on a seven-day uh, tour designed to underscore the administration's desire to rebalance America's military, diplomatic and economic resources away from economic and political sinkhole of the Middle East. 
uh, saying he was met with pageantry in Japan, South Korea, and Malaysia. Um, that Tom Donilon, Obama's former national security advisor and an architect of the Asia Focus policy, argues that if it can be achieved, this is the Trans Pacific Partnership, which did not seem to have much traction. The trade deal will solidify U.S. leadership in Asia and put the United States at the center of a great project, writing the rules that will govern the global economy for the next century. And this is the point I've also made. Vladimir Putin's excursion into Ukraine and Crimea moreover puts Chinese leaders in an uncomfortable position. To support the annexation of Crimea is to condone the violation of sovereignty and territorial integrity, a taboo in Chinese diplomatic doctrine, because the Beijing government fears that someday its own restive Western regions could seek to break away, which is the point I've been making. And said uh, the Chinese President Xi Jinping has recommitted himself to the unquestioned rule of the Communist Party. And in his diplomatic dealings, he has pursued what he terms the great renewal of the Chinese nation. Um, President Obama's trip is a signal of renewed commitment to Asia, produced few definitive signs that the U.S. is making progress in its bid for leadership. Um, half of the world's economic production is in Asia. It is the top destination for American exports, and by the end of this decade, the U.S. will, shift it, will have shifted its share of naval resources in the Pacific to 60% of its global assets. And I, for one, have certainly been caught by surprise in the fact that he is pivoting simultaneously Asia, Asia China, and Ukraine, Russia. Uh, the pivot to Asia is surely a strategy of encirclement and maintaining a gates keeper status via distant blockade operations. The president is subtle but increasingly aggressive and adversarial. One senses the hard power advantage is compelling at this moment and is as incontestable as flying those B-52s into the ADIZ and the nature of an advantage is you need to press it. I said the red light business is a canard. Um, and on that note, I'll put up a photograph of the snake by A. Weiwei. And uh, China, of course, accused Washington of trying to cage China. Uh, the Chinese Foreign Ministry spokesman, Quinn Gang, said, if you come or do not come, we will be here. I found this uh, Twitter pic from Eric M. Cunningham. Uh, because things weren't surreal enough, a leopard print APC is parked outside the court that sentenced hundreds to death. This is in Egypt. Mohammed Badi, of course, is the supreme guide of the Muslim Brotherhood. He was arrested by Egyptian authorities on 20th August 2013. On 28th April 2014, he was sentenced to death. The Elysee Palace tweeted a photograph of President Hollande and Jeffrey Immelt. I'll put it up. It's not clear whether GE will win this one. Currency markets. The euro popped higher yesterday. Got a, a, traded at 138.63 last, but touched 138.79, higher since April 11. Dollar index still in a slumber, 79.66. Japanese yen, 102.50, but markets are shut today for a national holiday. Swiss E, 0.8798. The pound, 168.14. Um, touched 168.58 yesterday, which was the highest since November 2009. Aussie 0.9247, um, touched 0.9228, which was the lowest since April 4. The iron ore price is starting to get a little eye-catching. Iron ore prices fell sharply again. India rupee 60.54, I think that gets to 57.50 on a compelling Modi win. South Korean one that looks strong, 1031.71 real, 222.34. Egyptian pound just shy of seven at 699.99. South African rand 1063.07. Interestingly, Deutsche Bank's foreign exchange volatility index dropped 25 basis points to 6.24%, which is the lowest level since July 2007. Dollar index, as I said, it's in a slumber. The Fed will probably cut its monthly asset purchase stimulus program by another $10 billion to $45 billion tomorrow. Sterling, I'll put up a one-year chart. That target's 173.50. I've been bullish since I was in the UK in August last year. The euro dollar, 138.63. Big move higher yesterday. And a lot of conversation that might have been the Russians. 
Samsung Electronics smartphone shipments rose 28% to 89 million units in the first quarter. Put up a photograph of Manoj and Robert introducing the S5 18 days ago here in Nairobi. And um, Samsung's S5, which I use by the way, has this fantastic uh, 5.1 inch screen, a fingerprint reader. But what I like best, the 16 megapixel camera. I haven't got the heart rate sensor going yet. And it's also water resistant rather nice. Coming to the commodity markets, gold 129503. I expect a much lower price in 2014. It couldn't even hold above 1300 recently. It's up 0.9% this month, but dropped 3.2% the previous month. I think it's headed lower. Crude oil par 89. That's still toppy, but you know, if we get a bad break, geopolitical news out of Russia, we can see that flip higher. I found this interesting for a company under formation in Dubai. Marka hasn't done too badly for itself. It received orders for more than $2.7 billion of shares worth some $75 million in an IPO. And you can see it's bull times over there in Dubai. And I'll put up a photograph of the Burj Khalifa. Frontier markets for the 12 months to April 16, 2014. The MSCI Frontiers Index delivered a return of 18.5%, outperforming the indices for Europe, North America, world, and emerging markets. Same is true for the year-to-date performance figures. Uh, MSCI Frontier Index has returned 11.32%, significantly outstripping its nearest rival, the Europe Index, which has produced a return of 0.8%. Coming to Africa, Angolan state visit to France, it, implications for the West is an article in Chatham House. Angola President José Eduardo dos Santos' two-day state visit to France begins today, marking a significant improvement of bilateral relations, but also signaling that Angola is wishing to reinvest in its relationship with Western partners. And it's a very interesting story. Um, from Chatham House about Angola, and of course, you know, Angola is an economy that everyone is keen to work with. And it is the biggest military spender in sub Saharan Africa, ahead of South Africa. I'll put up a photograph of the president of Angola, Jose Eduardo dos Santos. Interesting information from UNCTAD investments from Africa leapt by 57% in 2013, mainly on the back of investment flows from South Africa and Nigeria. South African TNCs invested in telecommunications, mining, retail. Nigeria focused largely on financial services. Intra-African investments rose significantly during the year. That's good news. I wrote that piece over the weekend of the IMF's Regional Economic Out Outlook where I said, you know, rising fiscal imbalance is the region's uh, Achilles heel. Investors trek to African funds, growing amount of money being allocated off a low base. The flows into frontier markets would be a few billion dollars, anywhere between three and four billion, which is significant compared to the total assets, but peanuts compared to emerging markets. South African all share up 7.23% this year, just shy of a record high. Dollar rand 10.63, stabilized here. I'm looking for it to strengthen now. South Africa's ruling party delayed parliamentary he he hearings into allegations that President Jacob Zuma and duly benefited from a state-funded $20 million home upgrade. You are shielding President Zuma from scrutiny. Wilmot James, chief whip for the main opposition Democratic Alliance, said at the hearing, what is happening here is scandalous. Egyptian pound just shy of seven. Egyptian stock market up 21.82% fell just uh, 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 just under 1% yesterday. The Nigerian all share is down 3.98% in 2014. The Ghana Stock Exchange up 5.65% in 2014, but all of those gains have evaporated because of currency weakness, and it's actually down 7.35% since the 21st of Feb. Milan-based NE is considering building a multi-billion dollar floating liquefied natural gas plant off the coast of Mozambique's northern Cabo Delgado province. Africa, of course, looms large in any future. The company's 2014-2017 uh, strategic plan states over the next four years, any will continue to focus on exploration. Key areas for any's exploration are Mozambique, Kenya, and East Africa, Congo, Angola, Gabon, and West Africa. And they, of course, have that tremendous find off the coast of Mozambique. 
I'll put up a photograph of my Twitter scene from the sea. Can your reinsurance is reported fully or after uh, fully a profit after tax increased 7.085%. The share price is up 32.25% this year. It trades now on a P of 4.778. That's probably the lowest PE um, at the, uh, in that insurance sec sector. Gross written premium uh, up 21.411%. Net earned premium up 21.65%. Investment income down 14.093%. Um, profit before tax up 11%, profit after tax up 7.085%, earnings per share up 7.25%. So, as I said, it trades at a steep discount on a PE basis compared to its peers. And therefore, you know, it probably has more headroom, but initially I think it might trade a little bit lower today. The regulators on the spot is U-Mobile deal stalls. On Friday, 28th February, three chief executives of telecom firms went to the Communications Commission of Kenya offices to close a deal meant to see you mobile exit Kenya. Two months down the line, the transaction seems to have stalled, with you mobile now accusing the regulator of scuttling its plan. In an interview with Smart Company, the CEO of you mobile Madhya Taneja, said the CCK's decision to tie the deal to a raft of new strict rules has complicated the transaction, making it difficult for the company to leave the market. Under the CCK's proposed regulations, both Airtel and Safaricom would have had to open up their infrastructure, mobile money agency networks, and SIM registration centers to all existing and new telecom firms if they wish to seal the transaction. Taneja questioned the regulator's decision to tie the deal to the new measures purported to be aimed at improving competition in the, in in the industry. He said the rules could be introduced independently. Uh, we've been fighting to get the regulator to enforce infrastructure sharing in the industry for years. This never happened until you, Mobile, announced an acquisition deal. We don't understand why. If these conditions were enforced earlier, we wouldn't have contemplated leaving the market in the first place. And uh, basically, it's not very. It doesn't look very good on the regulator's side. And essentially, I think. You is now in a death spiral. Interesting film from the Sundance Film Festival that I found. The link uh, on The Guardian. The link is on Rich Wrap Ups. And then Segera Retreat, East African Lodge in Laikipia, gets on Conde Nast's hot list. Uh, I'll put up a photograph of it. The Kenya shilling is at 86.80. The Nairobi All Share <coughs> eased 0 0.01 of a point, which is the least it could ease by. Yesterday, it's up 10.09% in 2014. The NSE 20 is back in positive territory. It's up 0.649%. Um, equity turnover yesterday was slower, but in many counters, buyers outpaced sellers. Kennel Cobill traded its highest volume session of 2014, 16.689 million shares, or 1.133% of the company. It's had its three biggest trading sessions of the year this month, in point of fact. Um, Safaricon closed unchanged at 13.05. I think it's going to go back towards the old time high of 13.20 and push on to 13.50. Kenya Airways firm 0.78% to close at 12.85. It's looking interesting again. Equity Bank maintained its blistering April rally um, and uh, has rallied 17.22% in April. KCB um, just marginally off a record high. I expect that to be crossed in, in uh, pretty imminently. Uh, housing finance second biggest gainer rallied 4.44% yesterday. EABL up 10.687% in April, big driver of the India index. Kenya Orchards, the biggest winner of the Securities Exchange, and up an incredible 140% in 2014. Market cap is just over a million dollars. Once again, thank you for stopping by and I'm grateful.